for over half a century, esoteric researcher and author Zechariah Sitchin devoted his life to presenting the evidence of extraterrestrial involvement in humanity's creation. These beings are akin to the Nephilim, giants mentioned in the book of Genesis. Sitchin claimed they were a race of ancient astronauts known as the Anunnaki, who came to Earth from planet Nibiru. My own journey began when I was a schoolboy, and uh, don't ask me how long ago it was. <laughs> I was studying in what was then Palestine, the uh, Old Testament in its original Hebrew language, and that I must stress made a lot of difference. Because Sitchin speaks on the importance of reading text specifically the Old Testament, in their original language. The Hebrew Bible, the Torah, is complex and has been translated in many languages, but without proper cultural and linguistic understanding, its original narrative can be lost. Zechariah Sitchin spent decades studying and piecing together the hidden narrative of the Bible and its contemporary text within the old world around it. What emerged was a tale about our ancient ancestors having been created and given civilization by a strange race of royal beings from a different planet. Before the story of Noah, before the story of the deluge begins, there are eight very enigmatic uh, verses, which evidently are the remnant of some longer story that was edited out or cut short or abbreviated. And of those eight verses, what is mostly known or common, <clears throat> uh, because it's used by preachers, Sunday preachers, is that one verse included in them that says, those were the days, the days just before the deluge, when there were giants upon the earth, and they married the daughters of men, had children by them, and so on. When Sitchin was a child, he challenged his teacher on the translation of the word giants, which came from the Hebrew word Nephilim. He knew that the word Nephilim came from the root word Nephal, which means to fall or descend. So the word Nephilim would denote those who had fell down or descended from the heavens. His teacher reprimanded him and told him not to speak out. Who were the Nephilim? Why did the Bible, which is very precise in its selection of words and terminology, describe them as those who had descended? This was the beginning for Sitchin's life work. In less than 50,000 years, we went from Neanderthal to landing astronauts on the moon. Civilized humanity appeared overnight in terms of our expansive history going back 25 million years to early hominids. It was as if an unseen coach was helping us quickly advance. The Sumerians are the oldest known civilization on Earth. They left behind countless enigmatic structures and texts reaching far back as three to 4,000 BCE. The Sumerians will forever be accredited with being the inventors of the wheel, pottery, the first system of writing, the first codes and laws, the first city-states and governments, and more. They were discovered underneath the sands of time during the 1800s by various scholars and excavators 
and what we found was fascinating. Their stories were the detailed source material for the Bible and other various sacred texts. Sumer, which is modern day Iraq, holds many mysteries to humanity's past and has yet to be fully deciphered and understood and is neglected by mainstream historians. Everything the Sumerians did was dedicated to the gods, but who were they? The Sumerians depicted all the known planets plus an extra one which they claim these gods known as the Anunnaki came from. Anything we can think of, the first of it was in Sumer. The following video clip is from the Iraqi transport minister in 2016, claiming that the Sumerians built the world's first airport, and they did so under the instructions of the Anunnaki. Perhaps many of the people of the Dakar government do not know that the first airport to be built on planet Earth 5,000 years ago before the Christian era was built here in Dakar. If you do not believe me, read the book of the great historian Zechariah Sitchin, who was an expert on Sumerian studies. Read the books of Samuel Kramer, or the books written by H.G. Wells about this. History begins from Sumer. He talked about the first airport built on the planet, which was in this place. This is the safest place for airplanes to land and take off. When the Sumerians settled here, they knew full well that the atmosphere here was suitable for flying to outer space. It was from here that the Sumerian spaceships took off towards the other planets. The Sumerians were the first to discover the 12th planet, which was acknowledged a few days ago by NASA and named Nibiru, and which completes its orbit around the sun every 3,600 years. According to the Sumerian creation epic, known as the Enuma Elish, our planet used to be a part of a larger planet within a more erratic solar system. This story was the most sacred tale of the ancient Sumerians and even carried on to being reenacted and told in the Babylonian New Year's festival. Billions of years ago, as our solar system was still forming, an intruder planet was pulled in by gravitational pulls. It is known as Planet Nibiru, Planet of the Crossing. The Enuma Elish describes this event as a dramatic conflict between the planets which are represented as gods. It was this planet and its mass that set everything into motion within our solar system, giving the planets their respective orbits. Nibiru and its moons hit the outer planets on its way in, causing some of the mysterious phenomenon we see today, such as Uranus spinning on its side as if knocked over. The Enuma Elish exalts Nibiru as the hero who is setting the decrees in motion or setting the planets in their divine order. The antagonist is a monster planet known as Tiamat, represented as a dragon in artwork. Tiamat was a large watery planet between Mars and Jupiter. Upon the celestial battle, which is a fantastic read, Nibiru clashes with Tiamat, cleaving her head essentially cutting the large watery planet in half. Her better half became the new little planet Earth, closing her scars over time. Her other half became what is known as the hammered bracelet or the asteroid belt, which sits precisely between Mars and Jupiter. Nibiru being a renegade, left our solar system only to return every 3600 years within a long elliptical orbit originally pulled in billions of years ago. It was this planet that would eventually give birth to the Anunnaki, our progenitors.
today astronomers look for this planet, they call it Planet X. Uh, they mean maybe the unknown planet, but it's also the 10th planet. They called it Nibiru, which means planet of the crossing, and the ancient symbol was the cross. Not from Christian times, but from 6,000 years ago. And they say that this planet, the 12th member of our solar system, has a very large orbit of 3,600 years, and every 3,600 years it comes between Mars and Jupiter close to us. And it is then they said that people, uh, people that look like us, not uh, <laughs> with little horns or green, uh, people they look, that look like us started to come between their planet and Earth about 450,000 years ago. Sitchin has revealed in his writings and in interviews that his early inspiration to investigate the idea that ancient beings might have had a part in humanity's creation and upbringing comes from a 19th century rabbi, master of Hebrew, and Bible commentator, Malbim. Malbim stated in his many writings that the term Nephilim was referring to a race of superior beings from another place in the heavens that came here and had children with the daughters of men. This idea is widespread in the esoteric and conspiratorial community, and it stems from the story in Genesis 6 which goes as follows, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Bible relates that these same sons of God had children with these daughters of men, and their children became mighty men and kings of the land. It was this story that Sitchin realized was a shortened version of what the Sumerians had told in their cuneiform writings thousands of years before. The Sumerians informed us that a race of beings called the Anunnaki had descended here about 4,500,000 years ago, according to the calculations concluded from what is known as the Sumerian King's List. The text is a list of legendary rulers going all the way back to the time of the gods. The gods, we are told, were headed by Anu, the father of the gods. However, the leader and mystical character of the whole story is Enki, the firstborn of Anu. Enki was a great scientist in all fields of science. He left behind tales that are echoed in texts such as Enki and the World Order. When we piece together the story, we are told by Enki that the original mission consisting of him and some accompanying help started with them landing on the Persian Gulf. It was there that they built their first station or city named Eridu, meaning home away from home. According to Sitchin, their purpose was to search for gold and minerals to help their dying planet's atmosphere. The goal was to amass enough gold to suspend in their atmosphere and reflect the hazard of space radiation. Amidst wars and upheaval on their planet, a rogue king who was on the brink of execution by the people escaped Nibiru in a spaceship. This king, named Alalu, headed for the strange small watery planet Earth with the hopes of finding gold so that he could be reinstated into good standing with his people. When he found it, he contacted Anu and his royal family, which would eventually take over the mission. Out of the countless Sumerian tablets, of which we've only deciphered a few, we have found interesting tablets that show images of what looked like astronauts and depictions of space vehicles, tablets that show star maps and even instructions on how to navigate into Earth's upper atmosphere from the outside. What is interesting is that to the Sumerians, planet Earth was known as the seventh planet, counting it from the outside in. 
as the mission was set up, mining began to take place in southern Africa, where Sitchin claims we found mines that date back up to 80,000 years ago. As the gods and the lower ranking Anunnaki began the work, eventually the workers had enough of the labor, as is attested in a Sumerian writing known as Atrahasis. The workers mutinied and demanded the elite found a better way of extracting the gold. Enki, being the clever engineer that he was, decided among the council of the gods that he would train a surrogate being to become a worker for the gods. The gods were perplexed and asked how this could be possible and what being would be used for this. Enki declared, this being already exists on earth. He would just have to upgrade its DNA. And that being was our hominid ancestor, the caveman. As far as I could make from those tales, <clears throat> their planet was losing its atmosphere. They were in a, at risk of, of annihilation of seeing all life end on their planet. Why do they look like us? We look like them. Because if you know the Bible, which is based on the Sumerian tales, at some point they engaged in genetic engineering and mixed their genes with the genes of uh, Homo erectus. We can use uh, various uh, uh, scientific terms, but let's say with, with early hominids, to bring about Homo sapiens, us. Sitchin explains that the process the Anunnaki underwent to produce the new Homo sapien was by taking the egg of a female ape woman and implanting in it the genes of one of their males, thus blending the genes of hominids and the advanced humanoid Anunnaki. Once this process was refined and they created a new being that had the right mixture, they took the fertilized egg and implanted it back into an Anunnaki woman. As the Sumerian tales state, there were birth goddesses used for this sacrifice in which males and females were birthed rigorously until a population was grown. This process was crucial and took a long time. Along the way, as some texts assert, Enki and his half-sister, Ninma, who was also a scientist, incidentally created mutated beings, some that were in their words, abominations. Sitchin claims that this story is the source for the book of Genesis, where woman is created by the surgical removal of one of man's ribs. To Sitchin, this was a metaphorical explanation of genetic engineering. And when the Bible states that man was made in the image of God, that the word image is referring to the DNA makeup of the Anunnaki. The early humans were kept in the experimental garden of Eden, a sort of observational containment where the Anunnaki observed and notated how the new creatures would react. Along the way, some of the Anunnaki departed knowledge to mankind and defied the rules of the council by giving us knowledge that would put us on an independent level, aware of our slave state and aware of our human consciousness. As the legend goes, we worked for the gods, building cities and all sorts of facilities for them. Eventually, the gods had offspring with us and things became a mess. The olden gods, who first set foot here with the hopes of saving Nibiru, now had to deal with their grandchildren, playing God, taking dominion over the earth, and manipulating mankind into religious subjugation. Out of all the chaos came wars among the younger gods, who also incited wars among men and their kingdoms. The Sumerians, the first civilization with so much respect for their creator gods, fell at their deities' lust for power. 
Sitchin chronicles the history of war on Earth in ancient times in his series known as the Earth Chronicles, originally written in the 70s. He explains that war was taught to mankind by the gods and some wars were fought through men for the selfishness and conflict between certain Anunnaki, what he called the Pyramid Wars were a series of their first wars. These were fought between the grandsons of Anu, the head of the Anunnaki on Earth. Anu's firstborn, Enki, was born of a concubine and therefore did not have the right to royal succession over his younger brother, Enlil. The two brothers were often held in conflict, as is attested in the ancient tales. This rivalry carried on to their offspring, who had an even more arrogant drive for control and domination. The Pyramid Wars were fought by Enlil's son, Ninurta, and Enki's son, Marduk. The wars were fought over the facilities at various sacred sites, such as the pyramids. These miraculous monuments were once used for some sort of technology lost to us, and to have them in possession and understand their proper use was of great importance to the gods of old. Marduk lost the initial wars, which stirred a furious anger in him, as is made known in the ancient tales. During these harsh conflicts, the gods resorted to the use of nuclear weapons, blowing up ancient facilities in the Sinai Peninsula, where an immense cavity can still be seen from space. As Sitchin states in this presentation, he once visited the area where there are remains of a strange blackened sand. Uh, if you go there, you find in that particular spot, you find in the middle of pure white limestone mountains. Everything is pure white. You see a huge field, a huge field with broken, burnt, and totally blackened rocks. There is a long text called the Era, Era Epic, E-R-R-A, Epic, that describes the reasons, who did it, how they did it, what the, the number of nuclear weapons that were used in 2024. There are Sumerian texts known as Lamentation texts, which speak about the desolation of their cities and the death of countless people due to these nuclear wars. The unintended consequence of the nuclear blast was radiation, known in the text as the evil wind, which carried across to Sumer, causing death to plants, animals, and people. Marduk was the victor of this vicious battle, which sparked the rise of Babylon. The Anunnaki had an interesting rule of succession, where each deity would rule according to their zodiacal sign during the age of that constellation. The Anunnaki taught us astronomy and astrology. Its use was crucial, not just for arbitrary means of policies, but these sciences could be used to calculate important celestial occurrences such as the return of their distant home planet, which was the harbinger of change. These changes were not just environmental, but also political. Around 220 BC was when the nuclear war occurred and Marduk claimed supremacy as his age, the age of the ram, occurred. The stalls stand, but the, the animals that were there are all dead. The houses stand, but everybody who lived in the houses lies dead in the streets, on the roofs, etc. And that was the end of the great Sumerian civilization. It is well understood that Abraham, the patriarch of the Judaic faith and its contemporaries, 
Christianity, and Islam was a part of a royal family from Ur, a capital of Sumer. Once the olden cities were destroyed, as is retold in the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah, he was told by angels, or Anunnaki, to leave before God was to destroy the whole place in a fire. Amidst this journey to a new home, Abraham's people would endure some hardships. The Israelites, Sitchin states, left Egypt in the story of the Exodus. They followed the gaze of the Sphinx because it lies precisely towards the 30th parallel, leading to the Sinai Peninsula where the Anunnaki had set up their ancient facilities that were now destroyed. The Anunnaki were ingenious in their construction of their first cities and sacred temples. They placed them on precise linear maps that could be easily seen and traversed by an aerial viewpoint. As they journeyed through the Sinai Desert, the Israelites eventually made it to their promised land, Jerusalem. Once they got there, they built a temple to Yahweh. Right around 1000 BC, Sitchin states, an interesting religious phenomenon took place. Kingdoms began representing the cross in various forms. As he states, it was due to the elite knowing that Nibiru and the gods were to appear once more and dramatic changes were to take place. This was the beginning of the prophetic age. Uh, in Babylonia, <coughs> on cylinder seals, the sign of the cross began to appear. In Assyria, the kings began to wear the sign of the cross on their chest. <coughs> the same happened in Egypt. Now these are all from around 1000 BC, 900 BC, 800 BC, 700 BC. Now what does it mean? What well, the sign of the cross is not a new sign. This is a very ancient Sumerian sign. And each time that the planet, Nibiru, that usually was depicted as a winged disk, was on its way back to our vicinity, each time that the reappearance of Nibiru was expected, the depiction, the symbolism, for Nibiru, for the planet, changed from the winged disk to the cross. As Nibiru was nearing, it became important as to who would be in control of the sacred sites and political spheres, who would welcome the gods, and whose version of religion and its rites would be dominant on the earth. Around 750 BC, the biblical prophecies began, starting with the prophet Amos. The prophets talked about various events, such as the day of the Lord and the end of days. To the priesthood, the day of the Lord was coming. It was described as a time of celestial phenomena. There would be darkness at noon. You would not be able to see the stars at night, and the moon would not be seen either. Around the same time that these biblical prophecies were being spoken, there were Babylonian, Akkadian, and Assyrian prophecies speaking about the day of the Lord, saying that these celestial phenomena would be about a Lord coming from the south from certain constellations. Sitchin presents that around 550 BC, an unusual and unexpected eclipse at noon took place. This was the last time Nibiru was in our solar system. The end of days was again a celestial phenomenon that was referring to a cycle. The Bible speaks about a cycle saying that the beginning will be the ending, the ending the beginning, and that the past is the future. This was all esoteric verbiage for those who understood the mysteries behind Nibiru and its significance towards our history and environmental changes on our planet. The only clue the Bible gave us about the end of days is when Daniel asked the angels as to when this would occur. The enigmatic answer was it would occur after a time, times, and a half time. Sir Isaac Newton the famous pioneering astronomer and scientist 
left behind a handwritten document in which he calculated this strange answer about the end of days. His conclusion was that it would occur in the year 2160 AD. But Sitchin realized something about Newton's math. It was the length of his zodiacal procession, the turning of one age from another. Sitchin points out that the priesthood of ancient times gave so much credence to the zodiac and its usage as a celestial clock because it was passed down to us from the Anunnaki to remember them and keep track of their eventual return. The term Armageddon is a word often misunderstood. It is usually used to denote the end of the world. However, it is taken from the biblical word Har Megiddo. This is where the final war on earth will take place. It is an actual location on a hillside in Israel. Not that long ago, the first Christian church in that area was unearthed. And upon its mosaic floors was found what appears to be the image of Pisces. Now, here, what Zechariah Sitchin is proposing is that the end of days, or the return of the gods, or Jesus Christ, is all terminology for what the Sumerians and the Anunnaki tried to convey to the humans as being a zodiacal or celestial phenomenon of the return of planet Nibiru and the supposed Anunnaki gods who lived there. This return would occur, as Sir Isaac Newton calculated and as Zechariah Sitchin proposes, in the next zodiacal house after the one we are currently in, which is the Age of Pisces, which this first church at Megiddo shows through their mosaic artwork. And this age is also the age in which Christianity and Jesus first began. What did happen, what did happen uh, in 556 BC when so many of the other nations uh, expected uh, the Anunnaki to show up again is that, is that instead, instead of showing, of showing up, up, they left. They left. Well, Zechariah was an extremely brilliant man. I mean, he was one of the few people in the world that could actually uh, translate and understand the cuneiform text, the, the original um, Sumerian writing, which was uh, only scholarly, you know, well-trained people could, could interpret and translate. And he did not have, he wasn't tied in with any particular organization. so. He didn't have anything to lose as far as, you know, people chastising him for having a way out theory or putting himself in danger from, you know, losing his criticism. job. Exactly. Yeah. So um, he didn't start writing his first book, though, until he was in his 50s. One publisher agreed to take it. And when it was published, they put it in the science fiction section of the stores. And that oh, outraged really? oh. him. Yes, totally outraged him. But he figured that, hey, at least my book is out there, and people who understand good research and appreciate good research will, yeah. will un understand that this is not science fiction, nowhere yeah. near. But that was one of the things that uh, his first publisher was apparently afraid of, is that, you know, putting out something that the, the people would maybe be calling crazy, but they didn't understand how well researched his material was. I mean, yes, yeah. Sitchin has his detractors but what, today, but when you're a pioneer and you're going out for the first time to uh, expose some things where others had not really been there before, I mean, yeah, Von Daniken was there before too, and Von Daniken was a pioneer as well. They both made mistakes. You know, you're, you're going to make mistakes when you're entering new territory, but the thing is, they blazed trails that 
now opens up and people realize there is something to this. And You're right. Gotta, and they took the hits for it. And at the same time, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater with, with, with Sitchin's work. I mean, a lot of his stuff, you, you just cannot be explained without having some kind of um, understanding that this really happened. Sitchin believed that all of these early mythologies were not just stories, but that they actually happened. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. First and foremost, I think we should give some respect and recognition to Zechariah Sitchin. Without his work, we wouldn't have the idea of the Anunnaki or the ancient alien theory. He pioneered the idea that the stories of the gods from all around the world all stem from the stories of the Sumerian Anunnaki. Although his work centered around the attempt to bring veracity to the Bible and also show that Homo sapiens, or humans as we know them today, were deliberately created by our elder brothers and sisters from a different planet, it doesn't mean that they are the creators of the universe. They too were created. And Zechariah Sitchin's work was excellent and phenomenal. Although it wasn't perfect and there are many detractors today, I think if you read all of his books, you can't walk away without thinking that he was definitely onto something. And this is the great legacy of Zechariah Sitchin, is that he pioneered and speculated what nobody else could or was daring to do. Now, many years later, we are starting to realize that the knowledge of the Anunnaki is just one part of a greater history and a greater understanding of what it is we are and what this is that we are in and what we are here to do. Mainstream history will tell us that civilization is about six to 9,000 years old, if that. But all the legends of our ancestors tell us that we are much, much more older than that but that we have forgotten our past and have been disconnected from it due to various cataclysms and wars, such as the Atlantean theory. And it was the gods, our elder brothers and sisters, who helped carry us along this process of civilization and conscious elevation. But for whatever reason, they had to leave, and they left us behind, worshiping them, through the major religions and occult systems that exist today, whether or not they return, I think it's important that we take the responsibility to carry on the task of caring for this planet and our future generations.